Amen. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats, if the musicians would like to come down. Okay, let's go to the scriptures then. Let's go to the first book of Corinthians. First book of Corinthians, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. So what I'm going to try and do... Now, people write entire books about this, um, entire theses about each different gift and the kinds and categories of gift and how they operate in the church. I'm going to try and keep it really simple. Is that all right? To the point of really dumbing it down. Not because you're dumb, but... I, th I sometimes think the more you talk about it and the more different um, words you use for different gifts, I think most people have difficulty processing it all. So I'm not going to be too theological or academic, um, but I'm not going to treat you as simple either. Um, and so I'm going to try and keep it straightforward. Is that all right? Are you happy with that? Good. Okay. So I'm just going to I'm just going to read this section. So the first book of Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, Paul is trying to address the issue of gifts within the church. Because the Corinthian church has not got it right. They're still a church, God still loves them, but their gifts are all over the place and they, they they're not operating them correctly. They are genuine gifts but they're not being used, they're being abused, they're being misused. And so Paul writes quite extensively on it. Strange as it is, sometimes the more Paul talks about something, the more confused some people get. Yeah, that's the problem with theology. It's a problem with a lot of academia. The, the more you try and explain every single little bit of detail, sometimes the harder it is to grasp what it is they're talking about. So let's just look at this first bit first. So before... Before Paul goes into detail about all these different gifts, he says there are different kinds of gifts, yeah? But the same Spirit distributes them, yeah? There's different gifts, but it's the same Spirit, yeah? Next verse. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, yeah? Now, what you might not get here, he's not using different metaphors to say the same thing. He's describing different categories of gifts, and you might miss that. Because he's, he's purposely using totally different words for totally different things. If we lump it all together, we'll get very confused. Right? So he says there's different, there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. And then he says, there's different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And then he says, there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. So before he goes into the detail and gives lists of different gifts, because he gives more than one list, he gives, a, he gives one list and then he gives another list, he's, he's talking about three categories of what we would call gifting. He's not talking about the same thing in three different ways. That's where the confusion comes in. He's talking about three different types of serving God. And that's why he uses a different name for God in each instance, because each of these three categories is given by a different member of the Trinity. That's why he does that. He's not a Victorian writing and just putting as many metaphors as he can. You know, when you read Dickens... And it's like metaphor upon metaphor upon metaphor. And it's just, it's just an elaborate way of speaking. He's not doing that. He's being very precise in the way that he does it. Okay. Can you put all three up at the same time? Is it possible to do that? Verse 4, 5, and 6, or doesn't it fit on? Oh, okay. So, right, there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There's different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And verse 6 there's different kinds of working. I like that word. I like the word work. Because when you say gift, it sort of implies there's no work. You know, if you're in a, oh, he's just gifted. That means he doesn't have to work at it. Really? 
well, you will see that's not true. There are different kinds of works working, but in all of them and in everyone, notice he says everyone in, in this category, it is the same God at work. If God working in you, so you're going to work. All right? So we've got those three categories, right? We've got gifts, one category. We've got service, another category. And then we've got work, another category. Now, one of the reasons this gets complicated is because there's lots of different translations around today. And different Bible translations will use different words to describe that. So if you use different Bible translations, so if you read the King James, can we go into the King James? Verse 6. Verse 6 doesn't use the word work. It says there are diversities of operations. So it translates the word work into operation, right? But we're going to see it's the same word. Okay, if you go in the ESV, have we got the ESV on here? Put the ESV up, English, I like the ESV. There are varieties of activities. So which is it? Is it work, is it operation, or is it activities? Well, it's the same word. It's just translated into different ways so that in English we get the fullness of what the meaning is. For that category of gift, there's three types. But that one alone has got three different words, but it all means the same thing. So can we see, that's why that I'm not going to confuse you by using so many different words. I'm going to stick to these three categories, okay? So let's, can you put up that PowerPoint? So we've read, this is the introduction before he describes two, two or three chapters now of gifts. We're not going to read all that. I'm just going to try and simplify it. Okay, so we use that term gifts for those three categories, yeah? Although we've already seen one of the categories, they're not called gifts. We tend to call them gifts, but it doesn't use the word gifts, but we tend to call it that. So the first category, bring it down. So you've got a gift, you've got who it's from, you've got who it's to, and then you've got the scripture that describes it. The most important thing about any gift is Who's it from and who's it to? Would you agree? Right? Because one of the confusing things about Christmas Day in our house when you have four kids, sometimes they all open the presents all at the same time. And then sometimes the wrong person owns the wrong gift and can't remember who it's from. Have you ever had that problem? And so mum and dad come in and they're saying, oh, who's that from? And they don't know because the kids don't, they don't care who it's from, do they? You see, when you're immature, you don't care who the gift's from. You just care about what it is. And sometimes they open all the gifts that, that much that by the end of the morning, when everyone's opened the gift, people have forgot whose gift is what. And mum and dad are thinking, that's, that's a weird gift. You know, wh wh why has my mum bought Joseph a dress? <laughs> that, that's never happened. It's never, it's never happened. But you see, if you get the gift, it, it doesn't, and then it's like, you know, if Joseph's trying to use his gift of wearing a dress, I'm going to stop it. Because <laughs> the gift's from the right person, but it's got mixed up with who it's to, yeah? And so let's look at the first category, which is what Paul is talking about primarily in uh, Corinthians chapter 12, but he does talk about other gifts as well. There's three categories. The first category is what we call spiritual gifts. Yeah? Now, the word he uses there for gift is the word charis, charismata, chari where we get the word charisma from. That's why people who believe in spiritual gifts are called charismatics. Yeah? If, if they abuse the gifts, they're called crazy charismatics. If they really misuse them, they're called charismatic chaos craziness. Right? Charisma comes from the word, well, charisma is the word for grace. It's a grace gift. In other words, you've been given it. Yeah? That's what it means. Grace, you don't deserve it. You've not paid for it. It's been given to you. You've not earned it. It's been given to you. 
what that means is someone who doesn't deserve it might get it. The people who get these gifts aren't, doesn't mean they've got the best character, doesn't mean they're the most holy, doesn't mean they're the most spiritual. They're gifts, okay? They're charisma gifts, grace gifts. They are from, the word is pneuma. The other categories are not pneuma. They are spiritual gifts. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit. They are from the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Who are they to? They are to people who are filled with the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the gift Jesus gives to us. Yeah? So if you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has gifts. How do you know someone is filled with the Holy Spirit? It's not a trick question. You have gifts. You have his gifts. Yeah? The evidence, that's why it's one of our statements of faith. If you say, I've got the Holy Spirit, but you haven't got any of his gifts, you've got a very poor Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit come and leave bits of him in heaven? When the, when the wise men came to Jesus, they gave gifts. Yeah? Right? When, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, you receive spiritual gifts. And according to the Bible, the first gift that people exhibited was the speaking of tongues. Yeah? All the way through Acts. That's what happened. So, the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to people who are filled with him. Yeah? Pretty obvious, really. Yeah? If I'm rich and I come to your house, a rich person has come into your house. Right? If we go out for lunch and I'm loaded, I'm probably paying for the lunch. Why? Because I'm the one with the dosh. Yeah? When the Holy Spirit comes, he's the one with the spiritual gifts. Yeah? Are we all okay with that? So let's go to the list of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Now remember, he's given different categories. We're looking at the first category. Right? Different spiritual gifts but one spirit. Okay. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom, or the King James would say a word of wisdom. Yeah. To another, a message of knowledge. There's nine, by the way, in the same way there's nine applications of good. The Spirit's fruit. The dove has nine feathers on one wing, nine feathers on another wing. You've got nine gifts balanced by the nine applications of the fruit. There is one gift through the Spirit, a message of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. Notice Paul keeps saying this. It's the Holy Spirit that gives these gifts. They are, they are supernatural spiritual abilities. You don't have these if you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you think you're clever, you're wise, well, that's fine, but that's not what a word of wisdom is. A word of wisdom is a spiritual knowledge you couldn't have had without the Holy Spirit. It's not something you learn. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Remember, this is a gift of faith. This is not saving faith. Everyone is to have saving faith. This is a supernatural empowerment of the ability to have faith in a, in, in a situation. Now, I'm not going to go through all the definitions of these. That would be a book in itself, okay? To another, gifts of healing, right? You can't heal. This is not being a doctor. That is a gift, but that's a different kind of gift. This is a supernatural gift, a spiritual gift by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that does this, yeah? To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, or King James would say, would say discerning between different spirits. Very important gifts. They're all very important and necessary. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay? So, nine categories there of gift. Notice healings. It says gifts of healings. Sometimes God uses supernatural power for, through someone to heal in one thing and uses someone else to heal in another thing. I've found that in my life. So for, for, 
I, I've often found that there's certain things I pray for. For example, over my ministry, um, I've noticed very often when I pray for women who want to have babies, they have babies. When they've been medically told they can't have it, it's just something God's used me for, you know. Um, and some people God uses in different kinds of healings, the different categories of that. And so they're the nine categories of spiritual gifts, yeah? Who gives those gifts? The Holy Spirit, yes? Right? Who can have them? Spirit-filled Christians, yeah? Emphasis on spirit-filled Christians. You can't have spiritual gifts if you're not filled with the Spirit. They're His gifts, yeah? You, you don't get a spiritual gift by believing in Jesus. That's salvation faith. To receive the spiritual gifts, you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah? You have to be filled with the Spirit because it's the Spirit that does it. Okay? That's not when you get saved. You get saved through believing in Jesus. Spirit baptism is when you receive the Spirit. And if you've read the Bible, you'll find the people who believe but hadn't yet received the Spirit. Yeah? So they are spiritual gifts. They're numa, they're grace gifts. They are given to spiritual uh, people filled with the Spirit. Yeah? Can you seek different gifts? Yes. Yeah, Paul actually tells them, we'll not read the whole chapters through 12, 13, and 14, but he says, earnestly desire the greater gifts. Seek to prophesy. So this is not a limitation. It's not elitism. If you are filled with the Spirit, you can seek greater gifts. Now, if you're filled with the Spirit, he empowers you with the ability to speak in tongues. In the Bible, that's what they did. On the day of Pentecost, they all started speaking in tongues when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And in the four examples of the baptism in the Spirit, that's what was happening. Now, we should desire greater gifts. So you have to desire them, seek them, and the Holy Spirit will give them. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Yeah, so that's the first category of gifting. Yeah, but then he said there was a second category of gifting. So go back to the chart and bring the second category down. So there are different kinds of gift, charisma, but what? But the Spirit who gives them. But then it says there are different types of service, but one Lord. Now, when Paul here is talking about the Lord, he's talking about the Lord Jesus. Now, this category of gifting, this list, is detailed in Ephesians chapter 4. So if we go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, we'll notice another list. Now, it's a totally different list. These are not spiritual gifts. So Christ himself, right, gave, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts. The Lord Jesus Christ gave these gifts, different member of the Trinity. Yeah? So Christ himself gave. Now, if you read the context, it says, when Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts of men. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ, the church, may be built up. Totally different than the other nine gifts. Right? You can see that. They're different, actually, in every way. Right? So go back to the chart, please. So, they're not called the same things. They're, they're actually, um, it's not called charisma. The actual word here is diakonos, where we get the word deacon from. Um, it's usually translated primarily, it says, it says service here, but in the Bible, uh, the, the Bible we've been using, it's primarily translated ministry. These are ministry gifts, yeah? They're service gifts. 
These are not given by the Holy Spirit, which surprises a lot of people. And you'll hear a lot of Christians, they'll talk and they'll say spiritual gifts and they mean all these things. These aren't called spiritual gifts. These are called ministry gifts. They operate differently. They have a different function and a different purpose. And they're given by a different member of the Trinity. Right? So these are given by Jesus. They are gifts to his church. But here's the main difference. These are not gifts given to people. These are people given to the church. Well, that's just the same thing the other way around. No, it isn't. There is a huge difference between a person being given a gift and a person is the gift. It's totally different. Because if you've got a gift, you can choose to use it or not. When you are the gift, the church has to decide whether to allow you to be that gift or not. Because Christ gives the gift, what in, if we just read there in Ephesians 4.11, he gives this gift to the church. That gift is a person. He is either a prophet, an apostle, or she, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. He gives some people to be that, because they are that. Nowhere in the Bible can anyone appoint themselves as that. Jesus appointed the apostles. No one can appoint themselves an apostle. Only Jesus can do that. It's Jesus who appointed it. Only Jesus can appoint a prophet. You can't appoint yourself as a prophet. You can use spiritual gifts of prophecy. That doesn't make you a prophet. You can tell people what the Bible says. That does not make you appointed as a teacher to the church of God's word. It's a totally different category of gift. And you'll notice when Jesus appointed people as a ministry gift. So Jesus appointed the apostles, yeah? Yeah. He gave them his authority and appointed them. In fact, when the apostle Peter confessed Christ, Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Yeah. What's happened? Peter, an apostle, is now functioning as the gift of apostle. So Jesus says, I can now build the church. These are foundational gifts given so the church can exist. If you haven't got these gifts, you're not going to have a church. Whatever spiritual gifts you think you've got, or may have, or really do have, without the ministry gifts, there isn't going to be a church. If you've not got a pastor, a teacher, an apostle, a prophet, or an evangelist, there isn't going to be a church. Because these are the ministry gifts that Jesus gives for the church to be built on. They're foundational gifts. So the church is built on apostles, prophets not tongues. Nowhere does it say in the Bible, the church is built on tongues and miracles and healing. No, the church isn't built on those things. They're spiritual gifts. Ministry gifts are the people. I call you Peter. You're the person now I'm going to build the Jerusalem church on. Now, there's going to be others. It's not just Peter, but it is Peter. It's a person who now Jesus has made a gift. Yeah? Am I, am I being simple enough? So, the apostles are appointed as ministry gifts. Now, here's the thing that blows a lot of Christians' minds, especially charismatics, before they've got the Holy Spirit. Yeah? The Holy Spirit didn't come until Acts chapter 2. The, the church is being built in Matthew chapter 17, right? A long time before the Holy Spirit comes. In fact, the Bible's very clear at this point, the Holy Spirit had not been given, it tells us in John. So, can you see, it's a totally different thing. Did they have spiritual gifts? Well, 
it's a little bit hard to tell because Jesus was with them. So because the Holy Spirit was on Jesus and they were under Jesus' authority, they were healing people and driving out demons, but it was under a different dispensation. The Holy Spirit had not come yet. They'd not spoken in tongues yet. They'd not been prophesying yet. They'd not been exercising the gifts as, as we see in Acts. So these are totally different types of gifts. These are leadership gifts. This is what the church has to be built. Now, all gifting we're going to look at helps the church be built, but it, it not in the same way as this. These are people. And this is why, and this is where some Pentecostals get confused, this is why some Christians... Let me give you an example. Has anyone heard, heard of anyone called Billy Graham? You heard of someone called Billy Graham? quite well known. Would you say he is the ministry gift? He's, he's going to be with the Lord. Now, would you say Billy Graham is a ministry gift of evangelist? Yeah. Well, if he's not, who is? <laughs> Let's put it like that. I mean, there's people like Ryan Ardbonke, but Billy Graham is probably one of the most well-known. Millions of people have come to the Lord through Billy Graham's preaching of the gospel. You know, a, a wonderful ministry gift of evangelist, yeah? Billy Graham was a Southern Baptist, right? The biggest denomination in America. The Southern Baptists are cessationist. They don't believe in spiritual gifts. They believe the spiritual gifts ended when the scripture was completed, which is a bit confusing because the scriptures weren't completed for hundreds of years. So I'm not quite sure what date they had in mind. And even when the scriptures were completed, most people couldn't read them because the spiritual gifts have not ceased as anyone who reads the Bible really can know. But that's what they believe. So Billy Graham didn't believe in spiritual gifts. I mean, that's, that's, you can't believe that, can you? But it doesn't stop his ministry gift from operating. That's why some churches that don't allow spiritual gifts to be operated, they don't let people speak in tongues or operate in words of prophecy, but yet they can build, big churches can be built because they've got a genuine pastor, they've got a genuine Bible teacher or apostle or uh, prophet. They, they usually don't believe in prophets, by the way, because that's too spiritual. But can you see a ministry gift operates totally independently to the spiritual gift? Yeah. Billy Graham was a great evangelist, and he didn't even operate any spiritual gifts. Now, I think if he had accepted them and believed in them, his ministry would have been even greater, right? And people like Reinhard Bonnke was a great evangelist, and he used spiritual gifts all the time. Words of knowledge, healing, prophecy, operated spiritual gifts, but that's because he used both gifts. It doesn't mean an evangelist is a spiritual gift. Evangelist is not a spiritual gift. It is a ministry service gift. Yeah, and they are given by the Lord Jesus himself. He did that even before the Holy Spirit had come. And this is why these gifts can operate in that way. Uh, so the pastor of a church might not be the one who uses the most spiritual gifts. That doesn't mean he's not the spiritual leader of the church because that's the ministry gift and it's a service gift as it's described there, that word diakonos. It, it, it literally means the same thing. It's the one who does the work. It's the one who serves, ministers, does the work. Now, the important thing with these gifts, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles, is they are not titles. You can't give somebody the title of a pastor and expect that to mean they will be a pastor. You can't hoodwink God like that. It's Jesus who appoints them. Now, the church either recognizes that or it doesn't. If it doesn't, the church loses out. If it does, then it receives God's blessing upon it. But what you can't do is say, we'll give them a title of a apostle or prophet. And sadly, denominations do this all the time. They appoint someone and say, oh, they're apostles now. And then, then they get fired. So they're not apostles. And now it's another apostle. And then you get another apostle. And before you know it, you're totally confused about who your apostles are because they're used as titles and they're not. They're people that God puts into the church 
to function through the, those gifting capacities. I'm not going to go through all the, diff, the five-fold ministries and what they all mean, but basically the church better have some or you haven't got a church. But you will only have some. Jesus gave some to be this and some to be that. And every church doesn't have all five. That's why you have to link in. I link in, we link in, we bring prof prophets in, we bring apostles in, we bring Bible teachers in, we bring other pastors in, we bring evangelists in. No one's all five, despite some people boasting on Facebook that they are. You know, I had one guy once phone me up and say, I believe I'm all five full ministry gifts. And I'm gonna, gonna say, well, perhaps I should worship you then. So only Jesus is all of them. He's the great apostle, and he's the prophet who was to come. He's the greatest evangelist, the greatest Bible teacher, the greatest pastor, which is the Greek word poimon, shepherd. He's the greatest shepherd. So, so we see that's a different category of gift, yeah? So what do you do with that gift? You see, if you're given a spiritual gift, it's a gift in you, yeah? You cooperate that. If it's a ministry gift, it's not a gift in you. It's a person given to you. I would suggest, and this is where there's not a lot of local church teaching on this, because it can it's very hard for the pastor to stand at the front and tell the church they better look after him. Because it's like, ooh, who do you think he is? But that's what you've got to do. Yeah, and, and our church board looks after me very well, and Pastor John and, and, and Joseph as the gift is, is, is one of those gifts as well. And so you can see that, in fact, Jesus once says, he, he talked about reward, you get a reward for this talent, and what he says, but whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Notice there he uses the word, it's the ministry gift. If God sends you a prophet and you look after that prophet, you'll receive the same reward as the prophet. Well, that's good, isn't it? So if you look after your pastor, you'll receive the same reward the pastor gets. Let's hope your pastor gets a good reward, eh? so that you can share it yeah so they're people right it's not it's not them trying to be a gift they are it pastor john is a pastor he's a pastor when he's trying not to be he's a pastor when he's digging his garden right he's a pastor when he's on the bus not that he ever gets on a bus but it, it's not these days no Right? That's what he is. It's not an act he puts on. It's not something he's it's not something he learned at Bible college. That that just helped him understand his pastoral calling and, and put the knowledge together, because you have to add knowledge and wisdom to your calling and gift, but that's what he is. Can you see? It's it's not a spiritual gift. It's who he is. Yeah, and it's the same with prophets. Prophets are just prophets. They're annoying because they say, you know, we should not have said that. And he's like, I can't help it. I'm a prophet. That's how it works. Yeah? Spiritual gifts, charisma, ministry gifts, these. Now, you can't be one of those if God hasn't designated you one. You can seek spiritual gifts. You can't seek to be an apostle. You can't seek to be an evangelist and a prophet, not as a gift to the church, because it's Jesus who chooses that. The 12 apostles, Jesus says, have I not chose you 12? He called the 12 to him. He put his authority on them. By the way, these gifts are designated by other mature ministry gifts. If you want a pastor in the church, and every church has to have at least one, preferably more, You've got to get another pastor to appoint them. That's how it works. You can't manufacture it yourself. Paul would write to Timothy, it's through the laying on of hands. Jesus would lay on hands. That's the confirmation. The church has to accept that. Sadly, over the years, you know, I've had people come to me over the years. I, I remember one guy in particular come to me, not been in the church for over 20 years, so most of you wouldn't know him. And he kept coming to me saying, I'm the evangelist in this church. You should be letting me preach. Well, no one in the church thought he was an evangelist except him. In fact, instead of leading people to Jesus, he probably drove more people away. But he thought he was. And he was saying, you should confirm this. Well, we're not going to confirm it. 
because it's, it's not something Jesus has told us to do. And sadly, too many people are seeking a title and a position and they aren't their people who function in a certain capacity. Yeah? So that's the second level of gift, the ministry gift. Okay? Okay. So third level, bring the third level down. So you've got the third category. Yeah? Which is called workings. Or the King James calls it operations. Or the uh, in, uh, English Standard Version calls it activities. I like the word work because that scares off all the people who don't really want to do anything. You know, it's like, oh, I, I am called to ministry. Are you called to work? Right? Oh, oh, I, I want to be a minister. Do you want to work really hard? I'd ban all the words and I'd just use the word work. That sorts out the men from the boys. Do you want to work? Now, it, Paul in this letter, he just says these are from God. But he's used the word Lord, referring to Jesus. He's used the word Spirit. Now, he doesn't say God the Father, although usually that's the term associated with the Father, God the Father. So I tend to think, well, that's obviously what he's talking about because otherwise we've got to remember the Trinity not giving gifts. And, uh, and these gifts certainly do exist that we're going to look at. So these are the, the next category of gift, operations, activities, work. It's the Greek word energia, where we get our word energetic from, someone who's going to literally actually do something. You know, this is the wonderful thing about church. There's loads of people with gifts, but who's going to do it? Who's going to do the work? And so these gifts, as we'll see, these are given to people but when you actually look at what these gifts are, and these are scattered just throughout Scripture, I've, I've given a, a few things here. Let's look at that first one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. So once Paul's described the th three categories, he then gives a list. Now, this is not the list of spiritual gifts. Yeah? That, 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 comes, uh, that, that comes in a different part. Now he's just describing, because he's given all three categories, now he's describing all three categories jumbled together. And this is where people get confused, because this is a different list again. This is not a list of spiritual gifts, and this is not a list of ministry gifts. This is a list of all three categories. Yeah? So he describes them. Let's see if you've followed me up to this point. Okay? Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Yeah? We're all a part of the body. So you've all got a function. Because every part of your body has a function. Yeah? You might not think it's that important, but it's still there, isn't it? It's like your kidneys. I don't know what they do, but I'm glad they're there. Now, you're a part of the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, now he's going to give a list. But remember, he's now listing all three categories. Now, there is still a, a sort of order of these, if you follow it. Right. First of all, what's the most important gift for functionality in the church? First of all, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. So he gives th three ministry gifts. Yeah? We're talking about importance a function for the church to operate. Yeah? Your heart is more important than your little toe. Now, I love my little toe. I don't want to lose it. I like it. It helps me balance. I cherish it. I love it. I kiss it. I lavish love upon it. <laughs> I cut its nail. All this stuff, right? But... It's not as important as my heart for my body to exist. Would you agree? Yes. And here's where we sometimes... Oh, everyone's important. Yes, they are. Everyone's valued. Yes, they are. Everyone's the same. No. No, they're not. They really aren't. Some people are more... You know, every part of this building is important. But if you, if you move the foundation, the whole building falls down. We can change the windows. First of all, the ministry gifts, or the church collapses. 
That's why Satan will always attack the leaders first. Because if he can pull them down, then he can pick off the church. Okay? So first of all, the three ministry gifts. Then, miracles, gifts of healing, what are they? Spiritual gifts. They come from the list in 12 verse 7, the list of spiritual gifts. So now he gives the next category, yeah? Miracles and healing, they're spiritual gifts. Yeah, they're important. People who have these gifts are important, but they come after ministry gifts. Yeah, you following me? Right. Then, helping and guidance. Well, which gifts are they? They're not ministry gifts, are they? And they're not spiritual gifts. They're helps and guidance. And then he, he tags on different kinds of tongues because he's going to address the issue of tongues in a minute, which is another spiritual gift. Yeah? But now he mentions two gifts that, we've not, that have not been mentioned. Because these fall into the category of the third type of gift. The gift of help and guidance. Now, is someone helping you a gift? It's not a trick question. It, it is, yeah. I am so thankful for people that will help. Do you know why? A lot of people won't. I am very glad of the gift of guidance. That there are some people I can go to on certain issues. I'm not talking, don't think you're spiritual now. I'm thinking of the practical running. So when we got the pandemic and we had all the lockdown and the health policies, I am so glad I could go to pa Pastor Mark, doc <laughs> Dr. Mark, and say, Mark, what do we do? Will you read all the government guidance? Because he's doing my editing and it changes every day and I don't believe them anyway. Will you read it all, process it all, write a policy, get, get an action plan? Will you put it all together so that we are guided through this maze of pandemic? And Mark did a wonderful job in doing that. Yeah? <laughs> Got no claps when I talked about pasta. <laughs> None. Right? So, so what is that? It's a gift from God. But it's not a spiritual gift. It's not a ministry gift. But it's still a gift from God. It's a gift from God the Father. Now, once again, here's, just to clarify, does, did Dr. Mark need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do that? No. No. He's, he's got a gift of intelligence. He's got a gift of ability that God's trained him through, that he's got an, uh, you know, an aptitude for, but it's a gift. Oh, well, it's not a spiritual gift. What does that mean? Does that mean someone who comes up to me and speaks in tongues is more helpful for me than that? No, that was far more helpful for the church than someone speaking in tongues, tongues edifies yourself and can help the church if there's interpretation. But actually, these gifts are just as important for the functioning of the church. Can, can we see that? So, so we've got these gifts, helping, guidance. Now, these gifts are almost, it's almost a limitless list. Right? If you think of so many pe gifted people who help God's church, but they're not, what they're doing is not a spiritual gift and it's not a ministry gift. Yeah, but without that, we'd be in a real, real pickle. Now, Paul describes this in another place. Go to Romans 12, verse 3. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. So here's Paul writing. Now he's writing to the Romans. So he's, this is why we, we need to put it all together. And he's going to give another list of gifts. But again, he's going to, he's not going to define each one. He's going to use the three different categories again, yeah? For the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith 
God has distributed to you. I, I like the fact that God tells us there, think of yourself with sober judgment, right? Not drunken judgment. Has anyone ever been drunk? Look at you all. <laughs> I know Pastor John hasn't. Yeah, I know he's not. I know, I know. Stop making us feel guilty. Right? Before I was a Christian, I would get drunk, you know, maybe once a week with my friends in town. Right? Here's what happens when you're drunk, when you're not sober. You do not think of yourself limiting yourself with your abilities. You think that you can do stuff you can't do. I can fight him. He might be seven foot tall, but I'll have him. Right? I'll go chat her up. She might be Miss World, but she'll fancy me. <laughs> and, and you have an overestimation of your actual ability. Yeah? And that's what happens when you're drunk. Now, one of the things with the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, is people thought they were drunk. Because the Holy Spirit fills you with power and gives you spiritual gifts, you can fall into the tendency of overestimating your actual abilities. And this is what the Corinthian church fell into. And this is what, sadly, a lot of Christians, not you lot, but some Christians, they fall into a delusion that their gifting is something that it isn't. That will lead to disaster. You try and do something God has not equipped you to do. Not only will you hurt him, harm yourself, you'll hurt other people and you'll bring disaster on the church. And so Paul is being very clear. Think in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. As the older I get, the more I realize I must limit myself within the sphere that God has gifted me. I mustn't try to step outside of my gifting and anointing. Because if I do, it w not only will it work, I'll wear myself into the ground trying to prove myself into something God hasn't asked me to do. Sadly, we live in a society where, of self-promotion where everybody's trying to make themselves look better than they actually are. You know, even with simple things like photographs, you know, you, you, you edit it, you put the filters. I mean, you look amazing, don't you, by the time the photograph's put on Facebook. It's wonderful. It's not you, though. It's not sober judgment. That's another thing when you're drunk. Everyone looks different. So, let's go down then. Okay, so that's just something that I've gone on to a diversion there, but never mind. Let's, let's go down. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. Right? Let's just stress again. We're not saying you're not, any, anyone is not a valued member of the body. Of course you are. But every part of the body has a different function. We can't all be the mouth or the eyes or the ears. We have to be the part of the body God has placed us in. These members do not all have the same function. For in Christ, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Yeah? So, I can clean my teeth with my hands. I can't do it with my feet, right? That doesn't mean my feet are not as important as my hands. And if I didn't have any hands, I would have to learn to use my feet. And there's some people can paint better with the feet than I can with my hands, right? Because the body compensates. But each part functions according to what it is. And your body doesn't get jealous of other parts of the body. Have you noticed that? My left hand never complains that the right hand does most of the stuff. In fact, the left hand's holding the microphone at the minute and he's very happy because it's usually the right. Right? In fact, that's it. There's no jealousy involved because it's the same body. Yeah? That's how gifting is supposed to work. So each member belongs to all the others. Okay, let's read down and here's where we get into then. So we have different gifts. Right? Spiritual gifts. Everyone should 
speak in tongues and seek to use other gifts, ministry gifts, only some are called to that. And so he lists them. We, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy, prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Prophecy does not have to be complicated. Use your faith in its in its simplest term. Prophecy, prophesying is just speaking God's word. In fact, prophesying in the spiritual gift, it is not directional or predictive. Society twists it to mean that. It doesn't mean that in the Bible. It's actually comfort, exhortation, and edification. That is not predictive, and it's not directional. It's simply edifying someone, comforting someone, and building someone up. That's the spiritual definition of the gift of prophecy. Yeah? Prophesy because of your faith. If it is serving, hold on, what service? It's just a gift. Some people, have you noticed, some people can just serve. Some people are useless. At serving, I mean. I don't mean they're useless as in not part of the body. You know, you, you ask somewhere and say, just, you know, just stand there and give people a drink and they forget. All you have to do is pass it on to them. They're just not competent in that capacity. If it is teaching, let them teach. Yeah? So he's, 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 he's just give us three different categories there. Oh, they're all spiritual gifts. No, they're not. Teaching is not a spiritual gift. It's a ministry gift. Yeah? If it's encouraging, if it is to encourage, then give them encouragement. What's encouragement? Is that a gift? Yeah, it, it is, because he just says it is. Is it a spiritual gift? No, spiritual gifts can be encouraging. Have you noticed some people are just encouraging? Yeah? I've been told I haven't got that gift, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, so someone I know tells me, be more encouraging. I'm like, all right, I'll try. Yeah. Some people can just be so positive, can't they? Whereas some people are just more truthful. Some are more gracious. Some are more truthful. They're both, you know, your character. If it's giving, then give generously. Is that a gift? Yeah. I mean, we should all give. We should all be generous, but some people are just, they're amazingly generous, aren't they? It's like they've always been like that. Before they were a Christian, they were like that. It's, it's, it's their character, it's who they are. If it is to lead, do it diligently, so that's a leadership gift. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, some people, they've just got that gift of like being cheerful and, you know, I, I have really not got that gift. <laughs> Apparently, I'm just, just like, I've never been like that. Before I was a Christian, I was like, I'm trying. You know, Pastor John's got it. You know, can you see, he's now, he's now talking about these gifts. Well, sometimes we just call them, you know, God's gifts of grace. It's got nothing to do with you being a Christian. That's just the gift you've got. And we, we're going to look at some of, more of these in, in a little minute. Right? Mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. So we've, we've got those things, yeah? So that third category, if you think about the kind of gifting that falls into that category, it's immense, yeah? And we tend not to think of it. So like um, people who can look after finances. It's not a spiritual gift. It's not a ministry gift. But if we did not have people looking after the finances, we would be in real trouble. You know, Carolyn's brilliant with money. She worked in a bank all her life. You know, she just thinks, does that automatically, looks after the finances, can tell you where every penny goes, all the bank accounts, where everything is. I, I am hopeless with that. Don't you, if you've ever tried to give me money, I'll say, no, go away, go give it to what the treasurer or someone, don't give me money. I, I, I don't know. I'm hopeless with money, so I don't touch it. But we have that gift. What about music? Is it a spiritual gift? No. Is it a ministry gift? No. Oh, everyone can do it then. <laughs> no, they can't. No, absolutely not. Oh, everyone can sing. Absolutely not. Yes, everyone can sing. 
but not everyone can sing, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? Well, well, how does that happen? It's a gift. If you've got a good voice, it's God the Father, by his grace, gave you that. Now, you can use that gift. You can go on Britain's Got Talent and be a celebrity if you've got a great voice, or you can use it to serve God. But the gift was given to you, not by the Holy Spirit, not by Jesus, but by God the Father. You've got that gift. If you've got these gifts, you've got them. You've had them all your life. Now, you may have to refine them and work at them and develop them, absolutely. But you can do it. There's some people cannot sing. <laughs> right? They have not got the gift. Well, how do I get it? You don't. You sing to yourself very quietly. And we, God loves that, but you are not having a microphone. Okay? Because that's not your gift. And it's the same with, with, with music. Some people just pick it up. And they can play. Yeah? And some people just can't. They're just tone deaf. They can't do it. Right? It's, it's just abilities. that People have these, you know, technical abilities. They look at all the technology. Some people can pick it up just so quick, can't they? They know how to do it. They know where the wires go and all this stuff. And now the electronics work and the websites and the YouTube and all this stuff. And they've got a gift. They might add to it and develop knowledge, but, but they've got an aptitude towards that. Yeah? And so we've got all these gifts. Yeah? Oh, but they're not spiritual gifts. What does that mean? Are you saying they're not important? They are. Now, the difference with those gifts is they have to be used dependent on the need. Now, if you've not got a ministry gift, you've not got a church. You won't have a church. Can you have church without music? Well, you can, but it's going to be hard. It's much better if we do. Can you have a church without someone looking after the finances? Not in our society, no. You've got to have someone doing that. So you pray for that gift. And so these gifts are just as important. They're still given by God. So can we see? That's just as important. So just bring up the chart again then. Let's try and pull this together. So we've got all these gifts operating in the church, yeah? The spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit, ministry gifts given by Jesus, and then these works, these operations, these functional gifts and activities, energy that are given by God uh, to people, and you were probably all, always had them, um, God put them in you at birth and you may have developed them, but you have a gifting in an, a, a, an aptitude in that area. Now, all these three have to work together. This is where the problem happens. This is where the, the issues arise because the gifts don't always like to give prominence to the other gifts. And some of the gifts like to try and control the other gifts. Now, there is order in these gifts. Uh, le but let me give you an example. At the pre I'll use the previous church I was at, not, not this one. Um, we had someone running the Sunday school. And they decided that the church was going to revolve around the Sunday school. So they would tell the pastor what he could and couldn't do, dependent on how it would affect the Sunday school. Now, you, if you've read the New Testament, there is no Sunday school in the New Testament. It was the parents. There's no gift of being a Sunday school teacher. There are gifts of people who are good with children. But that, in that instance, I'm thinking of, they were telling the pastor what to do. You've got to do, the church has got to do this, and you have to do it our way, and the, and the, the church meeting can't be so long because we want the... And so they made the church revolve around the Sunday school, which is totally wrong. I mean, it's good to have a Sunday school, but it can't dictate how the other ministry functions of the church operate and sadly in some churches that's the problem that happens and so and now you'll understand i'm not talking about our church but there's churches where the music dictates what happens not the ministry it's we're singing so many songs we're going to do it for so long and we are the musical gift so we will dictate what the church does you but Whilst music's really important and we love it, it's not a ministry. It's not the ministry function of the church. 
it's the work, it's the energy, or it's the operations and the activities that help us praise God. Essential, important, but it doesn't direct how the church functions. And in some churches it does. Because Satan gets in and it dictates what things can occur. So you've got to have the correct flow of these gifts or you're going to end up in real trouble. Because while they're most important, there is an authority flow from them. And it comes through the ministry gifts, then it allows the, the operational work gifts to function to support the ministry. And then you've got the spiritual gifts that, that edify, comfort, and exhort, that build up. That's the way it's supposed to happen. Let, let me give you an example. I'll use me as an example. Then I won't be treading on anyone's toes or upsetting anyone thinking they're talking about them. So if you look at those three gifts, I am a body. Have you noticed? I am a body. So Dave Jones, I'm not the body of Christ, we're the body of Christ, but I'm a body in my own right. So do I have any of these gifts? Thank you. Which ones do I have? I have a service ministry gift, okay. Teacher, okay. What about spiritual gifts? Do I have a spiritual gift? Okay. What about other gifts? What other gift have I got? Past as a ministry gift. Musical gift. Yeah? I can play the saxophone. Yeah? So we've got three. Right, I can speak in tongues, I can teach, and I can play the saxophone. They're three totally different categories of gift, yeah, that I can operate. Right? Right. How many of you have ever seen me play the saxophone? Right? Most of you haven't. Why? It's not important. It's a gift God gave you. That's not the point. It can't interfere. You know, if I, if I, every day if I preach to you, I'd got my saxophone. And so in the middle of my message, I'll say, now we're going to have a sax solo by me. You'll go, what are you doing? I'm saying, it's a gift. Yeah, it is. But it's not important. It is a gift I've got. I can play it. In lockdown, I did play it and put it on Facebook to try and encourage someone, although it's so many years since I properly played it, but a bit of practice, I can play it again. Is it a gift? Yes. There's actually... Um, I'm, I, let me try and think of other gifts I've got. Um, I can inspect buildings. Yeah? I was city manager for Barnsley, and I was city manager for buildings in Wakefield, right? So I have, I have a gift of looking, I can look at cities and buildings and, and tell you stuff, right? It's it developed through education and experience, but it's a gift I've got. So I should do all the building work. No. Just because I can operate that gift doesn't mean I should be doing it, because I should be focusing on the more important gifts. Yeah? And so it's the same, in, that's, whilst that's the same in my body, it's the same in the body of the church. Just because someone has a gift doesn't mean it's needed. And sometimes that's where a lot of the conflict in church happens. Because someone's got a gift they want to use rather than assessing whether it's the body that needs it. And if we use the example of music again, you know, sometimes someone, say someone's, I use that example because no one, I, th I don't think anyone, suppose someone can play the bagpipes. They've got a gift at playing the bagpipes. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. You are not playing. Why? It's not a gift that's going to help or that we need. But God gave me this gift. Oh, I'm sure he did. That's not the point. And in the past, so sadly, sometimes I remember we used to have an organ here, didn't we, Pastor John? And then it just became too difficult. To, and, it, and so we had to remove it. And I remember one person got upset. I got offered to a church, to be pastor of a church in South Wales, Pastor John knows the church, not, not far from where he used to live. And they asked me to be the pastor there. I went into the church, and they got this huge pipe organ right across the building. And they were asking, and when they interviewed me, because they'd asked me to be the pastor, 
And I says, well, we won't be singing to that pipe organ. And they were so offended. They were like, God gave us that organ. I mean, well, it surely did. But I won't be singing to it. I, I praise God for organ music. That's wonderful. But the average Christian doesn't really flow with that kind of music. So we've got to be something a little bit more contemporary in line with what most people can join in with. Yeah, genuine gift. Yeah, but we don't need that. And that's where sometimes people people get offended. Yeah, and we've got lots of things that are operating. But remember, they're... They're the works, operations, gifts, running the creche, running the bookshop, putting on the teas and coffee. We love all this stuff, but we don't have to have it. We haven't got to have a bookshop. We do it because it helps. We haven't got to have teas and coffees. We do it because it helps, right? But it's not essential. And it's amazing how many people switch the categories around. You've got to do this. No, we haven't. You've got to sort that out. No, we haven't. But God wants us to do that. No, he doesn't. God wants us to do the things we're supposed to do. And so it's very important that we understand those basic three categories, okay? Not titles. Go to uh, Philippians 1, verse 1. So, if we've got all these gifts, why don't we always call people according to their gifts because that can create real problems. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi together with the overseers and deacons. Okay? So, overseer is what the shepherds are called to do. Oversee the flock, pastors. Yeah? So, would you, would you say I was a pastor? Okay. Flip it into the King James. Now, you've already said I am that. So it's the same word. It's just in the King James, they translate it bishop. You said it. You said I am a bishop. So from now on, it's Bishop Dave. <laughs> you said it. You said it, not me. I said, would you say, I am that word, overseer. Episkopos, it is in, in Greek. Episkopos, where we get the word biscop from. Yeah? So from now on, you're all going to call me bishop. You aren't. <laughs> Some of you struggle with pastor. Right? Can you see, titles can be very dangerous. Because although you know, for 500 years, that's what that word is, yeah? To us, we're like, no, bishop means something else. No, it doesn't. It's just, it's come to be a title that's then been elevated, elevated into elitism where now bishop means like a high-ranking official that's in the House of Lords, right? Now that, we, we, we don't think correctly with titles, we think what we think they mean, according to our culture, right? So I don't want any of you calling me bishop, although technically I am, if you use the original language. Can you see why titles can be really dangerous? It's the same with apostles and people calling themselves prophets, and it can be really problematic. I really dislike titles because they, you can sort of give the wrong impression about things. Go to 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. So, um, this is that, you know, a, a bishop must be blameless. So he's talking about, switch it into the NIV. Now, the overseer, the oversight, the, the leaders of the church is to be above reproach, okay? You see, titles make you see things in a whole different way way of looking at things. And so what is, and so he's talking now about the ministry gift, the pastors, yeah? And have you noticed, when you read this list, it's got nothing to do with gifting. Because the person of a pastor is the gift. You don't, you know that's the, the gift they are 
That's not what you have to assess. What the church has to do is, do they have the character of that? And this is where the modern church has failed miserably because they just look at gift and not character. And the church is told to look at character, not gift. Of course they're gifted or you wouldn't even be thinking about them being the pastor. But be, you're supposed to look at the character. Are they above reproach? Are they faithful to their wife? You're supposed to ask these questions. Are they temperate? Or do they get drunk? Or do they think of themselves with sober judgment? Or do they think they're better than they are? Are they self-controlled? Are they respectable? Are they hospitable? Are they able to teach? They're not given to drunkenness. They're not violent, but gentle. They're not quarrelsome. They're not after money. That's the assessment, you see. Because it's the person who's the gift in ministry. It's not whether they can function in a gifted way. It's who they are. And we've moved away from this. And it's the character that he must manage his own family well. If he can't look after his own family, how can he manage the church? See, there's his children all being. And he must do in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? So we see, and, and there's all this, and there's the same list for deacons. Yeah? And, and once again, deacons, I mean, we tend to just call our leadership trustees, so we know what we're talking about. Because if you start using titles, it, get, it can get very confusing because there's lots of different terms for different leadership functions. It's the character, it's the people. Yeah? And so the gifts have to work together. Spiritual gifts should flow within that capacity. Sadly, what Pentecostals have tended to do is overemphasize spiritual gifts. Not, not say they're more important. I don't mean overemphasizing that much. I mean almost use them to override the other gifts. So I've got a word from God. Somehow that's more important than what the music's doing or what the pastor's doing. No, it's not more important. Yeah, because it's God. Well, so are the others. Well, so is everything else. Yeah, but that's just music. No, it's music that's helping us praise and worship God together. Your, your message in tongues is not more important than everyone praising God. The spirit, there isn't a spiritual gift of interruption. Why have we developed this? I don't quite know. I think one of the reasons is when the Pentecostal movement started, there was no amplification. There were no microphones. There was no sound system. So if someone wanted to give a message in tongues, you had to shout at the top of your voice or no one could hear you. And I think sometimes we've, we've forgot that there's this thing called a microphone. Because think about it. If spiritual gifts can only operate in that way, then if you've got a spiritual gift but you can't shout louder than everyone else, you can't use your spiritual gift because you, your voice is not loud enough. Well, that can't be right, can it? In fact, sometimes I find the spiritual people are the quietest people. And so sometimes we, we've, we've fallen into the errors of everyone's worshipping God and, and the team using the, the gifts that God's given us to the church to worship God, they have to stop because someone wants to shout something out. And when they shout something out, everyone stops worshipping. And everyone stops and listens. And it's like, hold on a minute. The most important thing is that we all worship. The gift can come at any time. Don't interrupt the corporate worship to put your gift above that. It's a genuine gift. But hold it until, and I don't think this is a big problem, I think in the past it used to be, let your gift come at the right time. And this is, if you read Corinthians, this is what Paul's talking about. You know, you can all prophesy in turn, you can bring gifts, but do it in, in, a, in an orderly manner. Don't stop worship to shout something out. Wait until the correct opportunity. And, and sadly, what we've developed 
we've almost got to the point where only the loud people can exercise spiritual gifts. It's true. Because we think it's something you have to shout out. And the bigger a congregation gets, the harder it gets. Because if you've got a soft voice, you, you'll, no one will ever hear you. Are, are you listening to me? I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm, I'm just trying to get us to see a spiritual gift is not how loud you are or how quickly you can interrupt what's going on. It's a spiritual gift. And if you've got a spiritual gift, but you don't want to shout out, just come and we'll wait for the opportune time and you can say it through the microphone. You don't have to shout it out. That's, that's for when, you know, days before amplification. And so, and spiritual gifts are never, and I say I'm not having a go here because I don't think this is a problem in our church, but let me just say it anyway because in previous decades, people have tried to do this. It is never for correction. Never. Spiritual gift is never correction. It's the leadership gifts that bring correction. It is never for rebuke. It is never to bring condemnation. Comfort, exhortation, edification. The Spirit of God does not condemn. So if someone says, thus saith the Lord, you're all going to hell. It's not God. Right? It is not teaching. It is not to be used to discipline anyone. Not a spiritual gift. It's not a leadership gift. And it is not for direction. It's not to tell someone what to do. In fact, no gifts are to tell people what to do. They are to give people information, but the choice is left to them. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit do not override your volition. You choose. Even the great prophets of the Bible, when Agabus came and says there's going to be a famine, or Paul, you're going to be put in prison, he didn't tell them what to do. He left it up to them. He, says, he just said what was going to happen in the future. He left it up to them to decide how they would obey God. Now, we have had times, I'm not, there's no one here I'm talking about now, where someone's come in, they've spoken against the church, they're not under any authority or relationship with the church leadership or the church in general, and they've come in and they've started to say, thus saith the Lord, that it's like, hold on a minute. And if you've been here over the years, you've seen on a couple of times, I've had to stop that. Like, you are not under authority, you're not a part of the church, you don't stand up and try to speak to the church as though you're the, the voice of God, and they speak, they speak as though it's God in the first person that's turned up. For the Spirit of the Lord saith unto thee, it's like, what do you mean by that? You mean you've been bad in the church, but now you've just walked in and you're going to pretend you're God? You aren't. That's not how a spiritual gift operates. It's how a spirit operates, and it's not the Holy Spirit. It's how a demonic spirit operates. Okay, so it mustn't be abused. Everything must be used in the categorization of the gift in its correct way. There is overlap. You, you, you can have more than one gift, but they have to flow together and they have to develop so that the church benefits, yeah? And things like hard work are not spiritual gifts, yeah? Um, discipline and exercise are not spiritual gifts, it's just something you do. Sometimes people will say, that's not, you know, can you help me move this chair? That's not my gifting. Okay. I know what is your gifting. A spirit of laziness. The spirit of apathy. Right? Praying is not a spiritual gift. Reading your Bible is not a spiritual gift. Yeah? Serving God in any capacity is not a spiritual gift. Fasting is not a spiritual gift. We're all called to do that, yeah? It depends on discipline and whether you're prepared to exercise what God has given you, yeah? Don't use gifting as an excuse not to serve or not to do things for God. That's, that's an excuse. Jesus gave the, 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 the parable of the talents, yeah? You'll notice the guy who got five talents worked the hardest, 
Five is the number of ministry gifts, right? The pastor has to work because everyone would notice. So he has to do it just so he doesn't look lazy, right? The, the, person, the, pr the problem is the person with the one talent who does nothing. And you'll notice what he said. Oh, it's hard serving God. It's like, you've got the least to do. Oh, no, it's hard. Don't say God's hard. God is gracious. And he, he's, he's loving and he's compassionate. Okay, well, right, I think I'll give you enough stuff there. So what we're going to do now to, to close the meeting, the team are going to come up. Do you want to come up, team? Are we going to just worship the Lord with a few praise songs? Are we going to worship the Lord? Are we going to praise God? And if there's any spiritual gifts, once we've finished worshipping, once we've finished praising the Lord, I want you to feel free to bring them. If you just want to praise God in your own way and you don't want to come out, now, obviously the Bible limits this. It says two or three, you know, give a message in tongues or two or three prophesy, right? We, we don't want to overburden anyone especially the church. But we're going to worship the Lord, and as the Holy Spirit moves through us, let's allow the Holy Spirit to use our gifts. Let's praise the Lord, let's worship the Lord, and let's see what the Lord does. Okay, come on, let's stand up then.